Hello, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Aaron Porras, here with ILTV's Morning Briefing. Another round of airstrikes have just pummeled a Syrian base with links to Iranian forces, the fourth such attack this month. Israeli fighter jets were reported flying over Lebanese airspace en route to this facility, though as usual, the IDF has neither confirmed nor denied involvement in the strikes. Regardless, the site of the attack is said to be a crucial weapons production plant for Iranian forces in the region. Proxy forces from Hezbollah are also known to frequent the base as well. This is the same facility where Syrian regime forces reportedly manufactured and stored deadly sarin gas used to carry out horrific war crimes against innocent civilians, though it's unclear if the site is still used for such purposes. What is known is that Iran uses the base to build surface-to-air missiles and operates under the Scientific Studies and Research branch of the Syrian government. This airstrike was carried out in the late evening before nightfall, something of an outlier in Israeli attack strategy which usually revolves around the cover of night. Videos posted to social media seem to suggest that Syrian air defense batteries were able to deflect a good portion of the attack, but smoke rising from the site does seem to indicate that at least some of the attack landed direct hits. Two Palestinians in Algeria were found dead Sunday in what Algerian officials inform was an accident caused by a gas leak. Israel, however, has been blamed for the deaths by many Palestinian reports, which attribute this incident to assassination. The two victims were identified as Suleiman Al-Farah and Mohamed Albana, who are from Khan Yunis in Gaza. While it's unclear if the victims had any connections to terror and Mohamed Albana is reportedly a physician, Israel has often been blamed for the deaths of Hamas members and agents in the past. For example, Hamas engineer and military commander Fadi al-Bach was killed in Malaysia in April, and Hamas drone expert Mohamed Zawari was killed in 2016 in Tunisia. Zawari was reportedly producing drones for the Iranian-backed Lebanese terror group Hezbollah. But in both cases, Hamas vowed payback against Israel. In other news, a Palestinian teen was killed overnight in clashes with Israeli soldiers in the Dahaisha refugee camp. The camp is located in the West Bank near Bethlehem, and the clashes occurred as the IDF was performing raids and arrests. Live fire and tear gas grenades were used to quell the riots after firebombs and explosives were thrown at the soldiers. Two Palestinians were arrested and a firearms manufacturing shop was also found. Six other unrelated arrests were also carried out across the West Bank overnight. The Jerusalem mayoral race is on and citizens are making themselves heard especially a group of ultra-Orthodox extremists who overnight vandalized city buses bearing the face of candidate M.K. Rachel Azaria. Azaria is the only female in the running and she's fighting for the seat coming from her experience in the Knesset with the Meretz party. She's also served as Jerusalem's deputy mayor in the past, but though many express enthusiasm for her candidacy, which was announced in June, it would seem that this group of six Haredi men is very against Azaria. Azaria responded to the incident saying the violent attempt to harm the elections does not represent Jerusalem or Jerusalemites or the Haredi community. The opposite is true, this is an extreme fringe group. She explained further that people of Jerusalem know how to live together with mutual respect, which is in line with her campaign ad, Believe It, We Can Live Together. Ironically, it's the very slogan that the group was ripping off the sides of buses in the night. Yesterday, tens of thousands of Israelis flooded the streets to protest the government's failure to extend surrogacy rights to members of the LGBTQ community. Those numbers culminated in perhaps one of the biggest rallies for gay equality in Israeli history, with nearly 100,000 Israelis gathering at Rabin Square last night, all of them demanding the state finally grant civil rights to one of the country's most cherished and flourishing communities. Though the Knesset's summer recess has already started, this impressive display of support for the LGBTQ plus community has already landed somewhat of the desired result. Opposition parties in the Knesset managed to gather the 40 signatures necessary to trigger an emergency special Knesset session on gay rights. Prime Minister Netanyahu's attendance to the meeting is mandatory. Netanyahu initially pledged his support to an amendment promising same-sex surrogacy rights last week in a video published on his Facebook page. But mere days later, Netanyahu shocked the LGBTQ plus community by completely reversing and voting to pass the bill without the amendment. Israel has often advertised itself as one of the only places in the Middle East where members of the LGBTQ plus community can live and love in freedom. But legislation supporting this freedom has often been less forthcoming due to the high makeup of ultra-Orthodox presence in the current coalition. But this massive demonstration of outrage is a big indicator that this may be a major issue in any future elections. Only time will tell if this protest turns the right heads towards change. New footage has now been released following the success of Operation Good Neighbor, 
where Israeli forces helped evacuate over 800 White Helmets and their families to Jordan. Though the White Helmets in Syria are a civil defense group which claims to be non-political, Syrian President Assad views them as Western propaganda. So when the regime forces began to close in, putting the White Helmets in imminent danger, Israel stepped in. Prime Minister Netanyahu also released a video statement explaining that they aided the White Helmets move to Jordan through Israel's Golan after President Trump, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau and others asked Israel to intervene. Israel and Syria are still technically in a state of war with one another, so Israeli government aid for Syrians is rare and typically quiet. That being said, Israel has reportedly sent hundreds of tons of aid over the border and has medically treated thousands in northern Israeli hospitals. That's all for now. I'm Aaron Porras and see you later with our main daily broadcast from Israel at 2 p.m. Eastern Time.